Despite there being literally hundreds of summons that have graced the Final Fantasy franchise, the group that can be considered mainstays has remained quite exclusive. Many such as Bahamut, Ifrit and Shiva were introduced during the first few appearances of summons, with those introduced after often struggling to make a strong enough case to become recurring. But some have managed to do just that, and one of the most popular examples is Alexander. Since its debut as a functional robotic castle, Alexander has assumed numerous forms. But what's interesting about this particular summon, outside of the fact that it's a literal manifestation of a building as opposed to a mythical beast, is that there has also been plenty of room for growth, and it's that growth that we're going to hopefully showcase today. So sit back and relax as we explore the complete evolution of Alexander. With summons having been introduced in Final Fantasy 3 and then resurfacing in Final Fantasy 4 and 5, the developers had already created 22 different beasts that could come to the aid of players. But with Final Fantasy 6 integrating summons, now known as espers, into the story and character progression, there was a notion that there would need to be an even larger roster for players to call upon. In the past, the initial 8 summons had always featured, but this time around, the developers decided that calling on the past was less important. So even though there were 26 espers featured in Final Fantasy VI, only 9 had featured in the franchise before as summonable entities, and only 5 of the initial 8 returned. With so much onus placed on creating original espers, the developers trawled through mythical beasts, folklore and fantastical tales. Looking back, it felt like no stone was left unturned, with one esper based on a large black cat that featured in Celtic mythology, and another derived from what the Aztecs named a specific species of bird. But perhaps the most unique, it's believed, would find its roots in a place as opposed to a living entity, and that was Alexander. Said to have been inspired by the gates of Alexander, which were constructed by Alexander the Great to keep out the barbarians of the north, they would later become a focal point of the Persian defences, and due to their importance, they would feature within many literary tales. And it was this defensive resilience that would become a fundamental part of Alexander the Esper, as it was designed as the fantasy manifestation of a castle, complete with two main turrets acting as arms and lots of smaller turrets on top. It would also be robotic and largely immobile. It's believed that the design was inspired by the Giant of Babel from Final Fantasy IV, and as such, alongside these distinctive traits, Alexander would have a colour palette that consisted primarily of silver, with yellow, gold, red and purple used to add flair around the different elements. From a gameplay perspective, Alexander was aligned with the Holy Element, and it could be acquired after defeating Rexol within the Dreamscape. After its acquisition, one of the few ways for most of the playable cast to learn the Holy Spell would become available, and then when called upon, Alexander would use Divine Judgment, a holy elemental attack that would attack all enemies for massive damage, highlighting its status as a top tier esper. Unlike many of the other espers introduced in Final Fantasy VI, which were tossed by the wayside, Alexander would reappear in Final Fantasy VII. As both iterations were designed by Tetsuya Nomura, there were clear visual similarities, but Alexander's design in Final Fantasy VII had to be adapted due to the use of 3D graphics, and this meant that even though the colour palettes were largely the same, there was much less fidelity. Alexander could again be acquired after defeating an enemy, but this time it was much less of a spectacle, as the enemy in question was Snow, found within the Great Glacier. And after obtaining the summon, the party would gain access to a powerful ally. However, as Alexander was again aligned with the Holy Element, even though it was quite powerful, positioned as one of the strongest summons due to its raw power, Alexander lacked utility. And that was because very few enemies in the game were weak to its move, which was now simply called Judgment. Alexander cemented its status as a recurring summon when it returned in Final Fantasy VIII as a Guardian Force. Again designed by Tetsuya Nomura, even though its menu portrait featured a similar colour palette to past iterations, its in-game visuals were more muted. It saw the colour palette toned down, and individual turrets removed from Alexander's head, back and shoulders. But more detail was placed on the two main turrets. Quite after being drawn from either the second counter with a deer, or via Candobal Pass within Ultima Seer's castle, it again positioned Alexander as a missable summon. After being acquired, Alexander would have initial affinity towards Adia, which made sense given the method of acquisition, but it would also align with Selfie and Renoa, the other two prominent magic users. 
Via the junction system, players could use Alexander to learn revive, and when called upon in combat, it would use Holy Judgment to deliver a powerful Holy Elemental attack. Alexander returned in Final Fantasy IX, perhaps because he had made a positive impression on Hiroyuki Ito. This time, the now venerable summon was designed by Yoshitaka Amano, and although many of the core tenants were retained, we also got to see some severe embellishments, including two massive white wings. Perhaps the biggest change, however, was that Alexander did not appear as a summonable being. Instead, it was woven into the narrative, where it was positioned as the most powerful Eidolon known to exist that was associated with the Gaian Crystal, an equal and opposite to Ark, the strongest known Terran Eidolon. As such, Alexander appeared during a time of desperation, summoned forth by Garnet and Aiko as they looked to defend Alexandria from Kuja and Bahamut. What happened next was a defining moment for the summon, as when it appeared, it was the literal protector of the Great Kingdom, dwarfing Alexandria's castle and using its huge white wings to shield it from harm, and through this act and its subsequent defeat of Bahamut, Alexander showcased its awesome power. After Final Fantasy IX, as the summoning system was evolved to focus on summons being extensions of the party, its role was diminished, as the developers must have struggled to figure out how they can incorporate a massive robotic castle. It meant there was no Alexander feature within Final Fantasy X, the only time it did not appear in a game directed by Yoshinori Kitase. But in Final Fantasy XI, it did return. Similar to Final Fantasy IX, this would see Alexander given a role within the wider narrative. Positioned as one of these sleeping gods, alongside the likes of Shiva, Ifrit and Ramu, Alexander was aligned to the Light Element, the game's equivalent of Holy. For the first few years of the game's existence, Alexander would remain an obscure presence, but this was changed following the release of Treasures of Artugan. Here, it was revealed that in the past, Alexander had animated a huge mechanised robot known as the Iron Colossus, which had been constructed by an old, now extinct civilization. But after being defeated, its remains were scattered throughout the lands. Within the modern day, it was reconstructed, albeit on a smaller scale, and it would serve as a plot device, and in a distinct evolution, as a boss with Alexander appearing as the finale of that particular expansion story arc. During the fight, Alexander would appear with a modernised design that gave it a more defined body, and position the turrets even more as arms. It would also have a slightly different shade of grey, with purple used in a more prominent way to previous iterations. Alexander would also have an expanded move set. In addition to Divine Judgement, this would see the appearance of moves such as Divine Spear, Radiant Sacrament, Mega Holy, and Perfect Defense. In March 2010, Alexander would then be made into a summonable avatar. This meant it was now associated with the summoner job, having been summonable by any member of the playable cast within previous appearances, but its role was restricted. Unlike many other summons, Alexander could only be summoned by a level 75 plus summoner, and only when they were under the effect of Astral Flow. Should Alexander not be blocked, this would consume the entire MP pool of the summoner, ending Astral Flow, and it would grant all party members within range perfect defense, making them almost impervious to damage and status elements for up to 90 seconds. In Final Fantasy XII, as the developers decided to bring forth Ukavi to serve as espers, as opposed to the traditional roster, Alexander did not appear within its traditional form. But it did still appear, and the manner of its appearance showed how much its status had been elevated in comparison to many of the other summons that had featured throughout the years. The Imperial feat featured numerous airships, with flagships named after famous summons of yore. The Eighth Fleet contained a light cruiser class ship called the Shiva, and a cruiser class ship called the Ifrit. At the helm was then a dreadnought class ship called the Leviathan. The Twelfth Fleet, commanded by Judge Zagabarth, also contained numerous ships, and its flagship was the Alexander, a heavy carrier that towards the game's conclusion would be used to protect the Sky Fortress Bahamut. In Dissidia, Alexander appeared amongst the roster of summons available to the player, with the two variants, which were based on its appearances in Final Fantasy VII and VIII, respectively, found within Destiny Odyssey IX. When called upon, Alexander would use Divine Judgement, but instead of dealing damage, it performed a defensive move, enacting a Bravery Freeze. This function would then be retained for Alexander's reappearance within Dissidia Duodecim. Alexander would next surface within Final Fantasy Fables Chocobo's Dungeon, and what players saw represented a huge evolution. Positioned as a guardian, Alexander was tasked with protecting Shermer, the Oracle of Light, 
and it would be due to this role that the player would square off against Alexander for only the second time in the franchise. But it would be when the fight commenced that players would be in for a surprise, as the visual design of Alexander was vastly different to previous iterations. Perhaps the biggest change was that Alexander was no longer rooted to the ground and would instead be levitating. This necessitated the removal of the two large turret arms that had always been a focal point, but the central armoured figure was still intact and the arms did still feature, except they were detached and acted independently. Throughout much of the fight, Alexander would use homing laser, and this would serve as an appetizer for divine judgement which would be used after a short charging period. When called upon, Alexander would then use the same powerful move, but its damage output would now correlate to the Chocobo's current HP. Final Fantasy XIII reimagined the role of summons, positioning them as Eidolons who were extensions of each respective lessee. As there were only six playable characters, this meant there were only six premium Eidolons featured and Alexander was associated with Hope. To ensure Alexander would work with the new approach, even though some of the staple design elements would be retained, such as it being mechanised, Alexander was now a biped with clear arms, legs and a defined head. First encountered as a boss, Alexander would use numerous physical moves as opposed to ones related to the holy element, showing further deviation away from what had been established. However, one key trait would resurface when Alexander was summoned, as after it entered into Gestalt mode, it would look much more like a structure, as it consisted of six turrets. Alexander would skip Final Fantasy XIII too, but it would return for the finale of Lightning Returns, appearing alongside the other Eidolons as they launched their final assault against Bonavelza. In Final Fantasy Dimensions, Alexander took on a role that was more typical of established summons like Shiva and Ifrit. This would see Alexander appear as part of the story, where it would test the strength of the party, engaging them in a duel. During the fight, players would get to see Alexander return to a more traditional appearance, but there were still a few embellishments added, such as a huge golden ring that surrounded the castle-like structure. Deviation also came from the moves used by Alexander, as alongside Holy, it would use Divine Shot and Body Slam, as well as enhancing spells like Protect and Shell. Its main move, which would then be wielded by players and dealt massive light elemental damage, was very similar to Divine Judgment, but this time it was called Divine Wrath. In Final Fantasy Type-0, the raw power of Alexander was on full display. Similar to Final Fantasy IX, Alexander could not be summoned by the player, but its destructive force featured as part of the narrative. Classified as a verboten Eidolon, Alexander was associated with the Vermilion Bird Crystal and it was called forth by the lessee called Lady Setsuna as well as hundreds of regular Agato soldiers. Due to the effort required, it was no surprise to see Alexander was massive in scale, featuring what appeared to be a full infrastructure built on the two turret arms and body, and its attack, Divine Light, literally vaporised the opposing forces. Record Keeper would feature a few versions of Alexander, with the iterations from Final Fantasy VI, XI and XIII appearing as bosses. And after defeating the Final Fantasy VI iteration, which would use Body Slam as a move just introduced within Dimensions, Alexander would then become accessible to the player as a rank 4 Holy Elemental Summon. In Final Fantasy Dimensions II, Alexander would see some interesting changes. Appearing as a light-aligned elemental summon, there were three separate versions of Alexander available, one for Moro and two for Amo. In the case of Moro, Alexander would have a much darker colour palette, and its visual style was quite similar to Type-0, with developed turret arms and numerous buildings appearing on the top of its body. When summoned, it would use Divine Judgement, a heavy damage light elemental attack, but it could also be used to teach various levels of the invincibility ability, harkening back to perfect defence from Final Fantasy XI. The first iteration of Alexander then associated with Amo also used Divine Judgement, but it could be instead used to teach the Banish Breath ability, a light elemental attack that would target all enemies. The second version would then teach the more powerful Banish Scar Breath, but while the visual design of the second version was quite traditional, the original was much more bombastic, featuring a very bright colour palette and small wings. Final Fantasy Explorers featured Alexander as one of the Eidolons that would need to be defeated, as part of the story. As had often been the case, unlike many of the other Eidolons, Alexander would appear as a stationary entity, with the design really doubling down on the castle aesthetic. Throughout the fight, Alexander would use numerous beam attacks, and after being defeated, it could be channeled as a crystal surge to perform Divine Judgement. Much like in Record Keeper, Mobius would feature numerous variants of Alexander, 
And although some would pull straight from the past, including Final Fantasy 7, 8 and 13, there were some new versions of Alexander too. The first was simply called Alexander. Introduced towards the start of 2016, Alexander was aligned with the life element, and this saw it more aligned with the defensive versions of Alexander, as its special ability was wall, which will grant damage absorption. The upgraded version was Alexander X. This would be inspired by Alexander from Final Fantasy IX, and it too was aligned with the life element, and its ability was wall X. Next was Extreme Alexander, which would have its visual design modelled on Alexander from Final Fantasy XIII. It would be aligned with the light element and would be able to use extreme divine judgment to deal considerable light elemental damage. The upgraded version would then be Extreme Alexander X, which would be nearly identical and could use extreme divine judgment X. Although Alexander was not present within either initial release of Final Fantasy XIV, it became a prominent figure within the game's lore upon the release of Heaven's Ward. Featuring as both a primal and a location, the history of Alexander bore similarities to what had been seen within Final Fantasy XI. It had been designed many years prior to the current timeline, but after a failed summoning, it would end up being hidden away. After learning of his existence and location, the Illuminati would then awaken Alexander, and the Warrior of Light would be tasked with its destruction due to its ability to control and manipulate time. To do so would involve entering into Alexander itself and encountering Alexander Prime. Unlike previous encounters with Alexander, this time the boss will be able to move around the area and its design, while very faithful, would be iterated upon by adding fingers upon the turret as a way of really emphasising that they were meant to be arms. Throughout, Alexander would use numerous moves that were pulled from Final Fantasy XI such as Divine Spear, Mega Holy and Sacrament, and it would be supported by allies in a similar manner to what had been seen within Final Fantasy Fables Chocobo's Dungeon. Within Shadowbringers, Alexander would return via the Epic of Alexander Ultimate Raid, and it was here that we would see an unusual trait resurface, Humanoid Alexander, which would be created following the merger of Alexander Prime, Brute Justice and Cruise Chaser. An odd illusion considering Ark in Final Fantasy IX was modelled after Cruise Chaser where it served as Alexander's opposite and equal. It would see some moves return such as Radiant Sacrament, and we would also get to see numerous variants of Alexander's classic move, Judgment. Alexander's appearance within Brave Exvius mirrored what was seen within Final Fantasy Dimensions. Encountered during the optional Sacred Valley dungeon, Alexander would need to be defeated in order for players to be able to wield its power. Upon doing so, they would gain access to an iteration of Alexander that had its design inspired by Final Fantasy IX, with huge white wings sprouting out of the colossal structure. But whereas its design was rooted towards one particular game, its ability set was quite varied. Alongside Divine Judgment, which was its evocation, its ability set would contain enhancements such as Protect and Shell, as well as Dispel, which was taught by Alexander in Final Fantasy VI and had been used during a few separate encounters. Alexander would also have Banish Scar, like in Dimensions 2, as well as Divine Castle's Protection, which was an allusion to perfect defence as it would greatly increase light elemental resistance for a period of time. Upon the release of Dissidia Arcade, Alexander would feature as one of the seven available summons, and its design was given a considerable refresh. Described as a walking fortress, Alexander's traditional turret arms were morphed into legs, but even though it would be seen walking when summoned, it would remain prone, and this was the same during its summon battle which appeared in Dissidia NT. When called upon, Alexander would boost default bravery recovery and increase maximum HP when leaving the battlefield, it would also use Divine Judgment to deal considerable damage. Due to the Mirage mechanic being so central to the gameplay of World of Final Fantasy, it was perhaps not too surprising to see the role of Alexander diminished. But its role was still interesting nonetheless, as in an interesting retcon, it would be revealed by Oiko that Alexander was a huge mirage that took the form of the famed Big Bridge. Now, Alexander has yet to feature within Brave Exvius, War of the Visions, or the Final Fantasy VII Remake project, which means the most recent iteration is therefore Dissidia Opera Omnia. Its design in this game was identical to what was seen within Dissidia Arcade and subsequently NT, and its application was also similar. Outside of Divine Judgment, a powerful Brave attack, Alexander's Blessing would raise maximum HP, and if the party's health fell below 80%, it would grant regen for 10 turns. All things considered, it makes Alexander a pretty interesting study. There have seldom been summons that have managed to muscle their way into the mainstay grouping, but after being introduced in Final Fantasy VI, 
Even though Alexander has not appeared with the same degree of consistency as say Ifrit, Shiva or Bahamut, it has still remained relevant. What's also intriguing is that even though Alexander did fall by the wayside as someone's transition to be extensions of the party, such was the respect and power associated with Alexander that the developers found a way to make it work and it had successfully returned in Final Fantasy XIII. This desire has been evidenced elsewhere with significant modifications made to Alexander's design and even when Alexander hasn't been summonable, it's been depicted as perhaps the strongest summon within that known universe. One thing has remained consistent though, its association with the divine. This would often see Alexander use a variant of divine judgment to deal significant holy or light elemental damage, but sometimes Alexander would take the opposite stance, tapping into its defensive attributes to defend the party. And we're sure that if Alexander does appear again within a major iteration of the Final Fantasy franchise, perhaps even within Final Fantasy 16, it will be much of the same. Either way, we hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, please consider giving us a like. As always, be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below too. And if you'd like to influence the types of evolutionary studies we produce in the future, make sure to check out our Patreon as supporters get exclusive voting rights on upcoming evolution videos. Alright guys, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, the Livestream, Gregory and Zdorn, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.